Hello everyone and welcome back to the IBM personal computer. So in the previous few episodes uh, we had a look at uh, generally at the computer and how to start it up and how to start using it and at uh, some of the high level programming languages which uh, IBM made available either immediately or, or very shortly after the release of the IBM personal computer. And uh, so we saw the, the first language which was basic which had both an interpreter and a compiler and we also had a look at some other compiled languages, uh, notably Pascal, Fortran, and COBOL. Now, uh, starting this episode, we're going to uh, leave the realm of the high-level languages and move on to assembly language. And uh, so we're going to move progressively closer to the, to the actual hardware inside the IBM personal computer. Now, assembly language is essentially a symbolic format for the actual machine language, which the... Uh, processor, the CPU, inside the computer understands. When I, when I built my own CPU, uh, we saw that uh, the, the CPU itself uh, considers instructions to simply be bytes, uh, a string of bits essentially. And those get interpreted and decoded and uh, they ultimately tell the hardware in the computer, in the CPU, uh, exactly what to do with the data that it's supposed to operate on. Um, now these, these strings of bits are, are extremely tedious to put together. And uh, so uh, very early on in the history of computer programming, programmers were able to, to not compose these, uh, these machine language bytes themselves, but to, to write symbolic instructions uh, in, in the form of uh, short alphanumeric words, and then have a program, which is an assembler, uh, translate those almost one-to-one -one into, into the actual machine code. And so the idea of using an assembler uh, was a, a perfectly well-established way of doing things in 1981. And uh, so, the, the, of course, the, the important point about assembly language is it is very intimately linked with the, with the actual architecture of the CPU, uh, which it is targeting. So if I write, a, if, for example, if I write assembly language for, for my homemade CPU, uh, and I have some assembler which produces machine language from that, well, that's no good on, uh, on the Intel 8088 CPU, which is inside this IBM personal computer. Uh, and so that, that understands a completely different kind of machine language, and therefore requires also a, a totally different kind of assembly language and an assembler program. So assembly language, is the first thing to realize, is, is very machine-specific. So the assembly language that this IBM personal computer understands is the assembly language for its CPU, which is an Intel 8088. And so any other assembly language, which might have been around at the time, um, is, is no good on, on this computer. So even if the concept of an assembly language was, uh, was perfectly well understood in 1981, the actual CPU in this machine was pretty new. I believe when the IBM personal computer came out, uh, that CPU was actually only two years old. Two or three years, maybe. And so uh, programmers who'd been used to uh, writing assembly language maybe for other architectures and other computers, uh, in particular probably for the 8080 CPU, which was also an Intel, but this time 8-bit CPU, well, they would have, you know, had to uh, adjust and, and, and relearn some of the techniques which they learned for this uh, other CPU if they wanted to start writing assembly programs for this, uh, this new computer system with its relatively new CPU. Now, another important point to realize when writing assembly language is, first of all, you need to know the particular CPU which you're targeting a lot more intimately than you would do for high-level languages. Um, second aspect is, uh, when, you, when we were writing BASIC or Pascal programs, uh, we could use statements and functions which were provided by the language. And as we saw uh, using the various compilers which we looked at, invariably the language itself would provide some kind of link library which contained implementations of all of these features and functions and statements of the language and which would translate them into suitable machine language. When we're writing in assembly, we don't have one of these language libraries available. So not only do we have to write the actual code and algorithms which we're trying to express in our programs, we also need to somehow implement the, the most basic functions. So something like uh, writing a string on the screen or printing something to the printer, that's actually a lot of hard work in assembly language because it's, it's, there, there is no such thing as a runtime library for assembly. Um, we essentially, as programmers, need to do everything. Now, one component which we do have available, even when we're running assembly programs, is the operating system. 
in particular this disk operating system and as you can see I've, I've just booted it up here and so DOS itself does actually provide a few routines which the assembly programmer can access and so this is a true if you like runtime library it's always there as soon as DOS is booted up there is some code somewhere in the machine somewhere in the memory which we can access to run some of the most basic routines and so our very first assembly programs which we'll be writing for this uh, IBM personal computer will be writing those to run inside of DOS to, to behave as a DOS program and so we will have at our disposal the various routines that, that DOS provides but that's essentially it uh, for the rest we'll, we'll have to be doing everything ourselves now I've read through a lot of the documentation which is available here and was available in 1981 uh, and to be perfectly honest, it's pretty scattered about. So if you're a novice programmer in 1981 and you want to learn how to program in assembly language uh, on this hardware, um, I think the learning curve would have been pretty steep. In addition, I, in, now in 2020, I, I obviously have the benefit of, of knowing where this architecture went. So the 8088 today is an extremely well-known and well-documented processor, and you can Google everything poss you might possibly want to know about that CPU, including about the way IBM integrated it into this personal computer, because we have almost 40 years now of, uh, of hindsight. But as I said in the beginning of the series, what, what I would really want to do is try and put myself in the place of someone in 1981. Uh, and of course, such a person would have a lot less resources and experience to rely on. And essentially, the set of documentation uh, provided by IBM here. And um, as we'll see, it's, it is possible. The information is all there, but it's, it's pretty scattered around. And so uh, uh, let's just see how far we get and, and how well we do by, uh, by looking at the various sources of information. So one of the first sources we have is the, is the actual program, which is the assembler. So there was a product which uh, IBM marketed, which is called this uh, macro assembler. So uh, let's have a look at the documentation that comes with that. So uh, on the face of it, it looks an awful lot like one of the other language tools, uh, which we like, like the Pascal compiler, for example. And so it uh, has a, a manual which comes with it, which is uh, 400 pages. And it, uh, you know, contains some, some instructions and some uh, language syntax and things like that. But as we discussed uh, a few minutes ago, the assembly language is, is of a fundamentally different nature from a high level language. So just knowing the syntax it, it's not really enough to be able to know exactly what you're doing in, uh, in assembly language. You really need to know the processor uh, quite intimately and, and understand how it works and what it expects and, and how it will uh, interface with first of all the assembly program and secondly with the hardware for example this uh, monitor and screen and keyboard uh, which is which is around which is connected to that processor and to be honest there's not much information about that general hardware environment in this uh, language manual this manual is mostly concerned with with, with syntax uh, how can you write a comment and how can you write a conditional statement and things like that but it doesn't go into any length into uh, understanding the actual CPU and that's something you really need to do uh, before you can start writing assembly programs so all right uh, maybe we'll have to come back to this manual at a later stage when we understand a bit more about the CPU fortunately there are some other references and one of the most useful to, to start out with is this uh, IBM technical reference and that is a book which IBM provided uh, with every IBM personal computer. And it's uh, totally specific to the model 5150, which is this first IBM personal computer, which we are emulating. And so that is a, is a very detailed book, once again, almost 400 pages. Uh, and it essentially goes over all of the hardware and the way the software, the, the, in particular the, the software on the ROM, on the read-only memory, um, which IBM provides default standard out of the box with their personal computer product. And as we'll see, this manual actually does uh, give us some pointers and, and useful references and information to, to get us started on, on, or to get a, a 1981 programmer started uh, on, on, the, on the learning curve to, to get to know the processor a bit better. So here we have a, a bit more detailed table of contents. And so the first thing we're going to have a look at is, is the actual processor. So let's uh, see if we can find some information. Here is a, an, an overview 
kind of a block diagram of all of the parts of the which are in the computer. So these are all the various kinds of peripherals, and this is essentially a block diagram of what's on uh, what IBM calls the system board, and uh, what today we would call the motherboard. So this is all very hardware oriented, but it gives us an idea of the different parts which exist inside the hardware. Um, and as we'll see in this and in later episodes, when we're programming in assembly, uh, sooner or later, we're, we're actually gonna, gonna come into contact with these uh, various parts of the hardware. So it's certainly useful to know about them. So here we come to a, a slightly more uh, detailed description of the, of the motherboard. Uh, at the time, IBM called this a system board. Uh, this is probably the most uh, important section in, in, this, uh, in this paragraph. The, uh, the heart of the system board is the Intel 8088 microprocessor. So this is the CPU. This is the component which will be interpreting and executing the machine language which our assembler will produce from our assembly language input. And so uh, our assembly language needs to be run, needs to be interpreted and run correctly on this CPU. So, so this is the hardware which we need to intimately understand. The processor is an 8-bit bus version of the 16-bit 8086 processor by Intel. This is a, yeah, rather a confusing statement. Um, internally, the 8086 processor by Intel is a 16-bit processor. What that means is that all of the registers which it supports are 16 bits wide. And all of the uh, our, uh, operations, for example, arithmetic operations, which it performs, it performs on 16 bits of data at a single time. Um, when it's uh, addressing data uh, outside the purview of the CPU, for example, external hardware, such as a monitor or a keyboard, a disk or memory, um, it does it by uh, inputting and outputting 16 bits at a time. That's the Intel 8086. However, the Intel 8088 processor is a variation of this 8086 processor, which also internally has 16-bit registers and does 16-bit calculations and uses 16-bit numbers generally to, for, for all of its operations. However, when it talks to the outside world, and that's what this bus means, then it actually only talks 8 bits at a time. And so you... You, in effect, your motherboard only needs 8 bits, which it needs to send to the CPU or receive from the CPU at a time, even though internally the CPU is actually working with 16-bit numbers. So it's a, it's a kind of a hybrid processor, and that's the processor which is at the heart of the system board in our IBM personal computer. All right, now, how do we understand more about this about this actual CPU and in particular about its architecture what what is what does this CPU look like to an assembly programmer and um, truthfully the most uh, interesting documentation about that is not really provided with the IBM personal computer you could download manuals from Intel specifically about this processor um, I have a few of those here if you look here in hardware there is a specific manual to the 80, about the 8088 and 8086 processors, and this is, this is a huge document, and that is really the manual which you would want to read if you want to intimately understand everything about that processor. But uh, I'm honestly not sure uh, what you would have had to do to obtain that manual back in the days. Uh, it was certainly not delivered together with the IBM personal computer. However, there is a condensed set of this information available uh, if we look a bit further down in this um, uh, technical reference, there is an appendix, and it's, it's appendix B of the technical reference, and this did come together with the IBM personal computer, and it's uh, the assembly language instruction set. And it's, it's kind of a very condensed form of the architecture that the uh, 8088 CPU understands. So all the information is here, although I'm not entirely convinced that somebody who's had no exposure to this CPU previously would have had enough information here to get started in assembly program. It's difficult to judge. I don't know because obviously being now in, in 2020 we know all about the x86 uh, family of processors so um, I'll, I'll let you judge how complete a description you think this is of the programming model for somebody who may never have been exposed to this CPU. Anyhow, 
we have a set of registers. And this is the set of registers which are available in the AT86, and they're split into two different kinds. So we have the general register file, which is all of these, and then we have something which is very Intel AT86 specific, which is the segment register profile. And we'll get to that in just a minute. The uh, general register, so we have an A, a B, a C, and a D register, and they're all 16 bits wide. Each of these registers can additionally, additionally be addressed uh, as, as half registers. So in your assembly language code, you could write some instruction which operates on the AX register, and that implicitly means that you're working with 16 bits. However, if in that same instruction you, you don't mention AX, but you mention AH instead, then you're actually doing an 8-bit operation on the eight most significant bits of the AX register. And if you do that same operation on the AL register, you're actually performing the operation on the eight least significant bits of the AX register. And that same organization applies to the BX, CX, and DX registers. Then there are a few more. There is a stack pointer, which is, uh, uh, as we'll see, the, uh, the x86 uh, instruction set contains stack instructions like push and pop. And so it, uh, it keeps track of a position inside the stack using a dedicated stack pointer. There is also a base pointer, which is another pointer into the stack. And that can be used in, uh, in some situations uh, where you're trying to emulate um, uh, C program or Pascal program behavior. And so you can, you can point one pointer to the actual position on the stack where you're pushing and popping variables while your program is running. And then you can keep uh, some other pointer somewhere higher up in the stack, for example, to the beginning of the routine. And so when you come to the end and you want to return to the calling routine, you don't need to explicitly pop all of the, uh, all of the values on, which are still on the stack. You can simply move the contents of the base pointer back into the stack pointer and essentially immediately uh, pop all the values and, and lose them and return to the situation which you, which you had when you entered the routine. So that's a, that's a useful extra register which, which programmers can use when they're writing assembly language to uh, simplify management of, of, of returning back from uh, subroutines. And then there are, uh, there's a, something called a source index and a destination index, and those are essentially address registers, which you can also use under certain circumstances. And so all of those are 16-bit uh, general purpose registers. Then we have the instruction pointer, which is uh, the same thing as the program counter on uh, some other architectures. So this is a register which at all times points at into memory, it's a memory uh, address register, which points to the position in memory where the next instruction should be read in. We have flags. Uh, our basic CPU had four flags. It turns out that the AT88 actually has 16 flags. In fact, not 16, but it has 16 possibilities for flags. Uh, but in fact, a number of them, like the, these marked with an X here, um, had no significance for the AT88. Subsequent processors like the 286 and 386 and the Pentiums and the cores and all of the processors we use today, um, they use all of these flags and they have all kinds of different meanings. But so back in 1981, uh, this would have been the complete set of flags that the AT88 recognized. And so then we come to these segment registers. Um, let's have a look just a few pages down here to understand exactly what's going on. When you have a 16-bit address register, for example, the instruction pointer, that means you can address uh, an, uh, uh, any memory address which can have uh, most 16 bits. And so if you calculate 2 to the power of 16, you find that that gives you access to 64 kilobytes of memory. You can uh, write any number between 0 and 64,000, 65,536 actually, into a 16-bit number. So you can address up to 64 kilobytes of RAM. Now the IBM personal computer, um, and, and especially the configuration which we have here, which has 128 kilobytes of RAM, um, actually has more memory than 64 kilobytes. And uh, this, the CPU generally is able to address up to one megabyte of memory. And so the way it does that is it actually uses two registers to calculate the, the effective physical address that the processor will, will be talking to. 
So you have what's called an, an offset or a displacement register. For example, uh, it, it doesn't say which register, but that could be, for example, the instruction pointer, or it could be one of these registers, or even one of the general purpose registers. So that is a 16-bit number, which uh, this diagram calls a displacement. And then additionally, there is one segment register, one of these four registers which the processor provides. That too is a 16-bit number, and what happens to, to obtain an actual physical address, which, which is 20 bits long, and therefore is able to, uh, to address 16 times 64 kilobytes, which is one megabyte. Uh, and so to, to calculate that physical address, what happens is you take this, the value in the segment address, you shift it to the left by four positions, which, which essentially gives you an address which ends on binary 0, 0, 0, 0 at the end, and then you add to it uh, this other 16-bit value, which is in the offset address. So what that allows you to do is to use a segment register as a base pointer to some part of memory, and then you can use displacement registers to access up to 64 kilobytes of memory starting from that base segment address. So, for example, here is the stack. And the way the stack works is that the stack segment, which is not the stack pointer, the stack pointer is one register, but the stack segment is a different register. Both of those point, ultimately point to a position in memory and they do it using this, this convoluted mechanism here. So the stack segment it points to some part of memory uh, which, which ends on all four zeros uh, in binary uh, as, its, as its last four bits. Essentially what that means is that the address is a multiple of 16. And so some part of memory here is the base of the stack, is the, is the stack segment, and that's the terminology which is used throughout uh, all of the, you know, the Intel software. And so this stack segment points to, to some position in memory. And then the stack pointer simply is a number which you add to this stack segment shifted left by four bits. And that gives you a real address, which is 20 bits long, somewhere inside these 64 kilobytes, which represent the stack segment. Now notice that two segments, uh, when, when, you, when you shift them left by, by, uh, by four bit positions, you end up with a number which is divisible by 16. And so there are always multiples of 16 when you, when you work them out. These beginnings of segment, segment boundaries, as they're called, they always lie on some multiple of 16. But there's no prohibition on segments being mutually exclusive. So you could have a data segment which is theoretically 64 kilobytes long, but, uh, and it starts on some multiple of 16, on some boundary, but then the, the stack segment could very conceivably point, for example, 64 bytes into the data segment. And then you'd have another segment, which is again 64 kilobytes, which overlaps the end of the data segment also by, in this case, uh, 64 bytes. And so these segments in this diagram, they're, they're, they've been drawn completely disjoint from each other, but that's certainly not always the case. And, and we'll see numerous instances where the segments which we're addressing actually overlap with each other. So for the assembly programmer, it's actually, it's not a very easy uh, architecture to work with because you need to keep this, this map, this memory map in your head at all times to understand um, which physical address you're actually addressing. To illustrate that point, we can use a program which is part of DOS uh, to try out and, and see how these various addresses, how, how that actually works. So let's uh, see if we can start it up here. And uh, so if I give it no arguments, it's simply a, a way for me to, to have a look at memory on the, uh, on the computer which is running right now. For example, there is a command called dump, and I'm going to dump something in segment 0000. zero, zero, zero. So what that means is the segment which starts at the very beginning of physical memory. So this segment, for example, is pretty low, but it's not exactly at zero. So I'm addressing segment zero. And I'm going to address, uh, I'm going to look at address, I don't know, for example, uh, 10, which is actually hex 16 in that segment. There we go. And so uh, the debug, debug program tells me that in memory right now on this uh, IBM personal computer, these are the bytes which are contained in segment zero offset 
10 hexadecimal, which is 16. If, on the other hand, I were to look at segment 1, and so segment 1 essentially means the segment which starts at address 1 shifted left 4 positions, which is 16. So at the physical address 16, offset 0, you'll notice that I find exactly the same contents. These two memory addresses are exactly the same. And so here you see very clearly that this, this offset of 10 and, and all of these three first, these three most significant, uh, what are those called, nibbles actually, four bit values, four bit parts of the, of the displacement. So anything left, and the, the 12 most significant bits essentially of the displacement, they can also be part of the segment because as any, any multiple of 16 is a valid segment address. And so we see that here. Uh, another thing, if I look at, uh, at actually the beginning of memory, so uh, address 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, you'll see here that this uh, offset 10, well, that's uh, actually what we had here. And so in here, I could have a look at segment which starts at 5. So if I dump the segment which starts at 5, hexadecimal 5, uh, and then uh, displacement 0, um, in, in most of the literature it's actually called offset. So offset or displacement uh, are synonyms. And so this is a, a typical address which consists of a segment and of an offset. And that's the way, that's the way it looks to the programmer. Uh, and you'll notice, so again here we have this 39E700, and that's exactly what we had here. So once again, this address, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 0, is exactly the same address as 0, 0, 0, 5, 0, 0, 0, 0. So yeah, um, that's something we'll, we'll come across time and again when we're programming on, a, on an 8086 or an 8088. Um, and is, uh, is one of the sources, one of the big sources of confusion and of complication when programming uh, an 8088 processor. In fact, it's so complicated that in uh, starting with the 386 processor, Intel abandoned this idea. It's still available on a 386, but uh, they also expanded all of the address registers to allow you to, uh, to simply write a linear 32-bit address. Um, and every, ever since we've, uh, we've programmed in these 32-bit uh, operating systems, um, they essentially all use linear 32-bit addresses because it's so much simpler than, uh, than this segmented model. But so back in 1981 on the IBM personal computer, we unfortunately have no choice. And so we need to deal with this, uh, with this memory management uh, system, this very basic memory management system, which consists of specifying a segment address and an offset address, both of which are 16-bit numbers, which the processor then uh, puts together, uh, and we can see that happening here, so, so we never specified that these are the same addresses, that's, that's something that the processor automatically does, um, and, and, and then finding out that we're actually addressing the same bit of memory. This I think is, is the real crux, this is something you absolutely need to understand, and if you don't have a clear picture of what's going on here, uh, you will have a, a very frustrating time trying to program on the uh, 8088. Um, I think once you get past that, stuff starts to become uh, quite a bit clearer. So let's assume that our 1981 programmer somehow has, has got the gist of this. Maybe he's, he's very clever and he understands this from the outset, or maybe he has uh, some documentation from Intel where this, uh, this whole organization is explained in a lot more detail. Um, it's it, this, it's a, a hurdle which you need to pass. Okay. Now, uh, as we said in the beginning, uh, when we're programming in assembly, we really don't have any libraries. The, the only software which is remotely available to us is, in fact, the operating system, DOS. And so then one of the next things we'll want to do is to understand what DOS looks like to an assembly program. And so that, fortunately, is something which IBM did document very well. So let's open up the uh, manual for, for DOS, which came with the disk operating system. So we've already looked at this manual, and uh, so we, we looked uh, mostly at the, at the end user commands, uh, the commands which I type here at the, at the command prompt, for example, uh, DIR. And so we, we used the DOS manual to understand how they all work, and uh, there's also this chapter on Edlin here, which we've used to, to edit some programs. Uh, but then as we go further down into the manual, we'll, we'll get into um, 
more deeper details and lower level of information concerning DOS. Uh, one of the programs here is, is the Linker program, which we've used a few times when in, for our high-level languages, and we'll also be using that for our assembly programming. There's a debug program, which, uh, which I was just running to have a look at memory, and so that, uh, there's a chapter in the DOS manual here to explain in detail what all the available features are in that program. Uh, and then, in, in the appendices, we actually get a lot of low-level information which is of interest to the assembly programmer. So we'll, we'll have a look at some of this information now. So let's uh, first of all have a look at this, uh, the, the general DOS structure. So here we are. The, um, so the DOS consists of a, of a few different parts. So we, we have uh, the boot record, which is the very first bit of DOS which is run. Uh, when we start up the computer and the computer starts reading the diskette, which we formatted to, and which contains the, the DOS operating system. So that's the first bit which is loaded. And what that does is load the rest of the program and, and sets, starts uh, start DOS booting up, essentially. And so then we get two parts of DOS. One of them is, is here the what's called the IBM BIOS module. Um, we won't go into the details of what's going on here, but for now we'll just think of that as the device driver, essentially. So it's the bit of DOS. Uh, which, which interfaces with the actual hardware in the computer, which could be the, the, the screen and the keyboard and the, uh, maybe the serial adapter and, and uh, things like that. And then we have another part of DOS, which is uh, more uh, associated with the high-level functions of DOS. So this is the part of DOS which, for example, manages files and manages directories on the disk. And, uh, and so that's in, contained in the second file. But all of that together essentially makes up the DOS kernel. And then we have a program uh, which is probably explained here somewhere, there we go, which is the command processor. And so once DOS itself, all of its functions and features have been loaded, there's this program called command.com, and that's the program which is displaying this prompt here, which we can see right now. And so that's the program which, uh, when I type dir here on the terminal, it interprets that and parses the command and looks for a, either an internal command or some external command on the diskette, which has that name. Uh, for example, when I type link, uh, at, the term, at the prompt here, uh, it'll first look in its uh, internal list of commands and discover ah, I don't have a command named link, so it'll look at the diskette and then discover there's a link.exe and then try and run that. All of that processing happens in the command processor. So those are the various parts of DOS. And so the command processor is, is the bit which is most visible to the end user. But the assembly programmer also has a whole bunch of uh, DOS functions. And those aren't located in the command interpreter, those are in these uh, initial, these uh, st uh, um, resident parts of DOS, and, and those functions are always there. And so let's have a look at some of those. So here are some of the function calls which are available to uh, an assembly programmer. And so DOS functions are called by placing a function number in the AH register. And so if you remember, what that is, is the most significant eight bytes of the AX register. And uh, so we, def the we provide some additional information in various registers, and then we need to call um, an interrupt of type, uh, this X means hexadecimal 21. And so the, uh, one of the things that the Intel processor supports is uh, called software interrupts. Some other architectures call those uh, traps. But so on, on the Intel processor, um, a hardware interrupt and a software interrupt uh, work in exactly the same way. A hardware interrupt is, as the name suggests, is, is uh, caused by a hardware event. And so what that does is it causes the processor to stop executing what is running right now and to call into some other bit of code. Uh, but we can, we can provoke the processor into behaving exactly that same way, purely from software, by executing this interrupt instruction. And so DOS works that way. When, when DOS is called from a program, the program essentially tells the processor, ah, I want you to mimic the behavior of some hardware interrupt, but there is no hardware interrupt, it's just me, program, that wants to access the DOS function. And so you do that by executing this interrupt uh, um, with a, what's called an interrupt vector uh, with hexadecimal 21. So when DOS takes control, it switches to an internal stack, one thing to note. So what that means is it will update the stack segment and the stack pointer so that uh, none of your user program stack gets overwritten. Um, user registers are preserved unless information is passed back. So uh, it, it takes a lot of precautions to make sure that uh, when you go back to your program, you retrieve the state that you started with. And then the um, user stack, there's some conditions here on the user stack. So essentially it's giving you a manual of all the conditions which you need to satisfy in order to be able to call DOS. So uh, we'll have to probably pay attention to that when we start programming. Uh, 
Uh, but then, uh, if, if we do that, if we make sure that we take care of all of that, then we see here we have a whole bunch of functions. For example, we can terminate a program. That's an important thing that we do when we write our program and it's running. We want to end it and go back to DOS. Well, that's one of the functions that DOS provides. Maybe we want to read from the keyboard. So that's a function which DOS provides. Maybe we want to display something onto, onto the console. It's another function which DOS supplies and it has a serial input. And, and so all, all these functions, so there probably here's some buffered keyboard input. There's going to be disk read and here, here we go, open files. All of these are the, the various functions that DOS provides to a program. And so all of those functions, they're all accessed by, as it says right here, putting a function number, which is this number, into the AH register and then simply calling 21 hex. So that seems relatively simple. Um, the function that we'll be using uh, maybe for our, our simple hello world program is probably this one. So this prints a string, which is function nine of DOS. So on entry, we need these two registers. So this is a segment register, and this is a, in this case, it's an offset. It's actually a, a general purpose register, but it's being used as an offset, offset address register. So they must point to some character string somewhere in memory, terminated by a dollar. That is to say a character with the hexadecimal code 24. So that's a, that's a character dollar. So this uh, DOS is a bit weird, and so if you want to write a string and print it out, you need to write hello world and then put a dollar at the end, so the DOS knows that that's where the string ends. And then each character of the string will be output to display in the same form as function 2. So function 2 is probably a single character output. Yeah, so um, function 9 is essentially a loop around function 2, but it's a loop that DOS provides for us, so we don't need to do it. So I think this is the, the first function that we'll want to try out when we start writing assembly programs. Okay. So, that's a, a lot of theoretical information that we've discovered and that, that we need to discover and go through. And as you can see, it's, it's kind of spread over all kinds of different places. Um, I, I myself, it took me, I don't know, about half a day to, to get uh, to all the information that I need to, to be able to start writing assembly programs. But of course, I know a lot of this stuff. I know the segmented model. Um, I know that DOS provides these functions because this has been true for, for all of the decades since 1981. And so probably a programmer in 1981 would have, would have spent a little bit more time uh, trying to get familiar with this. But, but let's assume somehow, you know, we've gone through all the information and, and, and we want to try our hand and, and start seeing how far we get in program. So what I've gone and done is I've prepared again a... So I have a copy of the assembly diskette, which came with the assembler. And I have a, a scratch diskette which contains some assembly programs. So let's have a look at that. So I started a, a basic uh, hello assembly program here. So let's have a look at that. So we're using the uh, our, uh, Edlin editor. So here we have it. And so um, this now, in order to understand the syntax or to be able to write this syntax, we'd probably have to go back to the assembly manual here, which is this one. And so, for example, uh, one of the first uh, statements we see here is this uh, segment statement. And uh, so we can have a look at that. So you can see at, uh, at runtime, each instruction and each variable of your program lies within some segment. This is a part of the assembly language syntax, which actually reflects the way in which this segmented memory uh, works. So remember that we're, we always have some segment register, which points to the beginning of some segment. Uh, and then we have 64 kilobytes, essentially, inside that segment, where we can write code and data and, and, uh, and manipulate stuff. And then when we want to go to some different part of memory, well, we need to organize some other segment register to point to the bottom of that segment. And then again, we have a window of 64 kilobytes into that particular segment. And the way that's reflected in the assembly language code is by using this uh, segment directive. So what happens is I'm essentially telling the assembler and also the linker that when you, when you build this program, when you build actual machine language for this program, you need to assume that all of this is going to be in some 64 kilobyte window somewhere. And I don't know exactly where it's going to be. I, I give it this name code, but it'll be up to, the, up to the assembler and the linker and actually also up to DOS um, at the end of the day to put that specifically into some part of memory and then to, to in, in, in essence, resolve this uh, symbol code into something, into a number, into a segment number. And in the same thing here, we have another segment, which is which contains our string here. 
and uh, and so that too uh, is uh, placed into some segment and they needn't be the same segment so uh, i've i've defined them here in different segments and so they're they'll have different segment registers uh, in different parts of memory but they may very well be overlapping so this is a very short segment this is nowhere near 64 kilobytes long so it's quite possible that the uh, the assembler and the linker will put this code segment somewhere and then put the data segment um, at the end where this code segment ends on, on the next 16 byte boundary. Um, but that will lie well within the code segment. So theoretically, I could also access this data from within with using the segment register, which is pointing at the code segment. And um, uh, th that's also one of the uh, one of the sources of the, of the lots of errors and bugs in in, in DOS software and, and early Windows software is the fact that uh, there is all kinds of magic which is possible using this uh, segmented architecture and uh, yeah it's uh, something we need to deal with when we're when we're programming for, for for this CPU anyway so here we have the assembly language so what are we doing um, first of all. I want to write this message onto the screen. So we see there's a, this is a data defined bytes is essentially what that means. So that too is an instruction which, you, which we can find here in the manual. So a defined bytes, what that does is it simply says place somewhere into the memory image uh, these bytes. Don't assemble them, don't interpret them in any way, just put those bytes right there in the memory. And I want to give them a name and I'm, I'm calling it message. Okay, so that's somewhere in this uh, data segment. Then, remember what I want to do is I want to call the, uh, this DOS function. So I simulate an interrupt and I give it the vector number 21 hexadecimal. And uh, the DOS function 9, if you remember, was the uh, print string, print a dollar terminated string. And I had to uh, give the address of the string, I had to give the segment of the address in register DS, and I had to give the offset in register DX. Now, unfortunately, there is a limitation of the AT88 processor, which means that if I had written here move DS segment message directly, that would have given me an assembly language error because it's simply not supported. If you want to write something into the DS register, you cannot use immediate operands like this one. And there are all kinds of limitations on the AT88, AT88 architecture. And you discover those as you're going along uh, assembling languages. So sometimes you can use CX and sometimes you can't and sometimes you can use DX. You can never use the segment registers in uh, uh, like this with an immediate operand, but you can put registers in them. And there are all kinds of very strange limitations. So yeah, you essentially you get used to those. So we need to do this in, in this indirect way. So first we move this uh, segment address of hello, which, which is actually data. So I could have written here, move into the X data. That would have done exactly the same thing into this uh, DX register, which is a general purpose register. And then I move that value into DS. And so that, that is allowed. And then I reuse this DX register since I've, it's, it was only a temporary register to get the value into the DS register. And then I use it again to put the offset in there. So I minimize my, the number of registers which I use. And I simply call this DOS function. All right. So that theoretically ought to be an example of calling a DOS function uh, in pure assembly language. And so uh, let's see if we can get that somehow to run. OK. So yeah, we don't want to edit it anymore. We've already seen this program. And so now I'm going to call the macro assembler. And I actually have the assembler diskette in drive A here. So I'm going to call that. And I will give it a source file name, which is hello.assembler. Object file is uh, fine. And now it's it'll actually be useful to see what's going on and which address diff addresses are attributed to the various bits of my program. So I will actually ask for a listing file. I will not ask for a cross-reference file. That's something you can read about in the assembly manual. And uh, so we have uh, no warnings and no errors. But notice if I'd left that, uh, that move instruction to move directly into the DS register, I would have got an error here. And so that, that would have told me that it's, uh, you, you, can't, you can't work that way. All right, and so as ever, the last step is to link this object file directly into an executable. So let's try that. So the object module is hello.object. The run file is hello.exe. Uh, yeah, we will ask for all the listing we want. 
Now, in the case of libraries, in this case, uh, we're purely uh, working in assembly language, so there is no default library. And this, all of the, these, these 12 lines of machine language, which we wrote, that's it. That's the entirety of our program. And so everything else, DOS, it, I don't need to externally link DOS because DOS is always there. DOS is loaded in the very beginning when we put the diskette in the drive and start up the computer. So we don't need to link to DOS. And that's one of the reasons why we have to access it using this software interrupt. It's not a normal call to some address somewhere in memory. No, it's a, this, the DOS organizes things so that it looks to the program as if it's, a, as if it's a, an interrupt service routine. So no libraries here. And then we'll just uh, accept all of the defaults in uh, these various prompts here. And we have one error, uh, but it doesn't tell us uh, what it is. But if we can find that out in the hello map file. So let's have a look at that. And it tells us we have no stack segment. Ah, and that's quite bad. And so again, when you go through the manual and you look again at the, uh, the, the segment instruction, you find some extra information, which is that you can define such a thing as a stack segment. And you have to do that because your program needs access to some kind of stack. And it's, uh, again, we're not using a high level language, so it's up to us, the programmer, to organize a stack. So let's do that. Let's uh, edit our program again. And I see it here, okay. And so what we're gonna do is we're simply gonna add another segment, which will be the stack segment. But instead of public, which is the, I think it's the default even of the type of segment. So the type of segment essentially tells the linker, if I have another f object file and it also has a code segment, do I want the two of them to be merged together or should they be private to this object file? Or uh, all, all of that kind of uh, information is contained in this uh, type of segment, which I'm defining. And so there is a specific type for the stack, which is stack. So I need to define a stack segment. Uh, so let's uh, insert it here behind the end of the data segment. So I'll uh, issue an Edlin command 12i. Insert a new line and now we'll have a stack segment. And so its type is this specific type stack. Okay, and so what do I want in the stack segment? Well, I want, you know, enough room for a reasonable stack for a small program like this. Uh, let's go with 256 bytes. That's probably more than enough room. So we, again, we need to define some bytes. And in fact, we need to define 256, which is 100 hexadecimal of them. And uh, so we can say uh, dupe is a, you can find that in the, in, in the macro manual here, macro assembler language here somewhere. Uh, what that does is uh, I'm, I'm going to write a character after here. So I could say 100 dupe, uh, for example, zero, and that would put a 256 zeros. I'm just going to write a question mark. And what that means is I don't care what the value is. And so hopefully the assembler will then not actually clobber my, my object file, not write hundreds of zeros in my, um, in my disk file and simply reserve that space in memory, but not initialize it in any way, because I don't care what's on the stack. I'm, I'm going to put stuff on there. I just need to make sure it's a region that no other uh, program uh, or DOS itself will access. So uh, that's the meaning of that question mark. Okay, and so that's it. That's, uh, that's, the, that's our stack segment. So we can end it and, uh, and that should be it. So let's quickly check our programs. So we have our code segment, we have a data segment, and now we also have a stack segment. And simply by the fact that we have a segment of this special type stack, uh, that should help the linker now to be able to, uh, to produce the executable file. So we go through the same uh, process we did before. First, we have to assemble our new version of the assembly source code. Again, we'll want to have a look at the listing. You don't want the cross-reference file. All right, so let's, let's have a look at that listing just to, to see what's happening. Yeah, so we probably want to, uh, you know, we should have used the printer. Um, can I do it this way? Uh, hello, dot listing. Okay, and so here we see, this is the, the code segment. And so these are the offsets inside the segment. Where the segment will go, that's actually something the linker will take care of. So uh, this, this assembly phase doesn't know that yet. 
but he does know the relative offsets of these different instructions. And so you can see here, this instruction uh, contains a BA and then a whole bunch of uh, lines and then an R. So all of that goes at address zero in the very beginning of this segment. And then at address three, we have these bytes uh, 8EDA. So that's the machine language, uh, which corresponds to move DX into the DS register. And then we have th that, so that's two bytes. That's these two bytes. And we have these bytes here, which is move DX and the offset of message. And so that's uh, um, three bytes again. And so what's happening here, these, these dashes, they simply mean that we have no idea what the segment of offset is at this time. So that's something the linker will have to take care of. It'll have to insert the correct address in here. Um, we do probably know that the offset is zero, but again, it could be there's some other object file which also puts stuff into the data segment. And so that might come in front of the message. And so although we've provisionally placed a zero here, because provisionally the message string is at address zero inside the data segment, um, that might not be true after we finish linking. And so that's why it's uh, made this record relocatable. Then we have this here, which is move uh, the, the hex value 0, 9 into the uh, eight most significant bits of the AX register. So that's this in machine language. And then we have our, int, uh, our interrupt with uh, vector 21 hexadecimal. So those are the machine language instructions which our assembler has produced. So that looks good. And apparently our code segment is a C bytes long, which is 12 in hexadecimal. So that's good. That's a very short code segment. And then we have a data segment here and that's, uh, that's exactly 16 bytes long. That's interesting. Okay. So, okay, that looks fine. Uh, the stack segment here, there's a whole lot of question marks. So we have no idea what will go there. We also, we don't care. But so yeah, it looks like the assembler has done what we expected of it. Okay, so no, we don't want to edit that, obviously, so uh, we'll abort. And uh, so now we'll just go ahead and link our new object file, which now contains a stack segment. And it was called hello.object, and we want a hello.exe. Again, we'll have our list file. And we have no external libraries, and all of this is just uh, fine. So let's see what happens, and we now have a hello.exe. So we can try and run that. And so what we expect to see is uh, is this uh, call to the DOS function, which ought to display hello world uh, using this uh, interrupt 21. So let's see if that works. All right, that's interesting. So it worked, we have hello world here. Um, but as you can see, I'm actually stuck now, so there's nothing else I can do. Uh, I'm, I'm not getting back to DOS. And uh, that's something we're going to have to take care of. So uh, if you remember when we were looking at the DOS functions, there was a specific DOS function to return to DOS from a program. And we didn't do that. So uh, we're not returning to DOS. So um, yeah, right now the computer is stuck. And there's uh, only one way to, to uh, start up again, and that's to reset the computer. All right. So, um, well, we haven't quite finished because, uh, okay, we got Hello World on the screen, but, uh, but we couldn't get back to DOS. Um, in order to fix this problem properly, is actually quite a lot of work still because we, we now need to start understanding uh, in more detail how DOS actually loads programs and then exits from those programs. And so uh, because we've uh, already spent a lot of time, um, I think we'll uh, look at that problem in the next episode. So uh, today we were able to start programming in assembly. Uh, we were able to find some information about the CPU architecture and, and actually get some functionality out of the processor. And so, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll conclude our Hello World program in the next episode. So, uh, see you then. I heat up, I can't...